Welcome everyone on this super cold day. Maybe the coldest day. Uh, yeah, uh, well, it's my great pleasure to uh, say hello again to Ali Sitas, uh, who's not new any longer to the audience in Amirka University. Uh, and uh, on behalf of the university and on behalf of the School of Culture and Creative Expressions, uh, it's a pleasure to host this talk. Um, which is um, it's on an area which uh, forms a part of one of the courses that the second year students are doing, which is called Art and Political. So, um, what I is going to speak about hopefully speaks to the concerns of that course uh, that what is it that we call the political and what is the relationship between um, word, gesture, sound. <coughs> What is the role that aesthetic transformation uh, plays? How, to, how does it relate to social movements and so on? Uh, Ali has been working in these areas uh, both as a practitioner as well as uh, a theoretician for a very long time. And um, um, some of us have also been in conversation about some of these issues, uh, in you know, trying to understand what might be um, questions about the relationship between art and the political which uh, allows us to think about our local context intensely but at the same time doesn't trap us within local context but, and it's not something that appeals merely to an abstract universality but actually allows for movements and people to talk through art. Uh, so I won't say very much more than that. Uh, thank you. Right. Um, there is a key tension. There's a key tension in one's life if one is a practitioner in the fields of arts, and one is also able to think at the same time and to reflect on what is going on. And also, there's a deep contradiction between a lot of the people that have been schooled in the arts, performance, literature, and so on, and what situations make them to become, and what resources they draw in order to be created. And this is a peculiar contradiction. And I would ask you all to look at any text that defines Indian literature, or literature in general, or the history of art of this, or the history of art of that, or theatre in South Africa, there is a kind of implicit plan for what people learn. It is from X to Y, it is from Plato to NATO, it is from, I don't know, Tagore to Rashti. And it depends on the editors of those canonical texts that define the education system yeah. you know, to redefine it, to change it, to add a bit here and a bit there. That is what happens everywhere. So you have literature, normally African literature, and then you need South African literature. When you're doing South African literature, then you can study Indian literature and then you draw comparisons and you hope that some of the nonsense you do is accepted in literature in general, which is usually aimed in two three cities in the world. It's literally like that. If you are in those cities, you're closer to the editorial policy of what defines the world. And then we're deciding somebody from your village gets canonized even if the village wants to stone that person at that particular point in time. And we know that it's true in terms of what the Nobel Prize does, and so on. So there is this process of selection, kind of exemplification, and then communication to younger generations that this is how it is done. Okay. So when you are to become an artist, you have to do these classics and these important people, otherwise you're nothing. 
And there's nothing wrong about that. Okay, it is, it happens. It is peers fighting each other, it's universities, it's Professor Sir Madden and so on doing all kinds of interesting things. It responds to a university market, publication happens, scholarship occurs. So there's the one tract that, that we exist in. And then comes sociology and social science to spoil the party, okay? Because basically he tries to say, no, no, wait a minute. There's all kinds in between things, between, let's say, Tolstoy and Mayakovsky, that are invisible if you put them next to each other in a book. Something happens in between. And this became very obvious to me experientially in South Africa in the 1980s, when the insurrection was all around us, when we thought we could change the world, when we thought we could overthrow apartheid, create a new, more democratic, perhaps socialist, and so on, more caring community. And in that moment, you started seeing all kinds of peculiar things happening, and I will come back to it. But it alerted me to the fact that during the process of insurrection, during the process of emergence of a social movement, things were happening to art. Art was changing. Its forms were being transformed. Content was becoming new. New words were being found for experiences unthought of before. There was something peculiar over and above the slogans, the songs, the call and response codas, the kind of the propagandist theater, there was something that engulfed everybody and positioned everybody in peculiar ways. And I started thinking, but surely this is not a unique South African thing. Surely it's happening everywhere. And that set me out on an exploration. Now to understand, what is it? that makes this peculiar relationship between society, social movements, a major confrontations, conflicts, <coughs> revolutions, and so on, an art, an expression. Now, social movements, we all know from sociology, and as I was saying yesterday in class to those who were there, are sustained upsurges of people challenging an authority, a status quo, a class structure, something like that, okay? Those are these upsurges. They sustain, they involve mobilizations, they involve little gatherings, bigger gatherings, enormous halls, stadia, streets, marches, demonstrations, whole range of forms of violence, counter-violence. These are involve people. There is this peculiar public that is being mobilized during that time. Whether it was in the 1840s, in the 1870s, in the 1900s, in the 1930s, in the 19th, you know, it, things go up, things go down. But during that process, I thought, and I observed, something happens. And yesterday, I tried to explicate this through using a few peculiar words for the new guests today, let me write them up because I'm going to connect them quickly. What we argued yesterday is that artists, as idiots who are doing these things, belong to aesthetic constellations. <coughs> what allows us to do that are specific aesthetic acuities that we have. And through these, and through these moments of insurrection and so on, what emerges, is what I'll come back to, is a kind of a radical impulse. It is not of the left, by the way. <laughs> it might be of the other kind. You know, a radical impulse. And through that, things happen. 
What I wanted to say is that through these constellations, we are beginning to experience both a sense of our acuities being more open to all kinds of things that are happening elsewhere and begin to nurture a kind of an international of the imagination. That's the other word, which is about people we have never seen, never met, perhaps read a little bit about, in the older days read more than seen or anything like that, but an imagination that begins to make us do all kinds of other things. So what I'm trying to say is that through this is that if you're good at what you do in a sense in the arts, in performance, in literature, and people might smack you at the beginning and so on, but if you have this initial impulse that makes you not an accountant but somebody who does other things, there are certain acuities that are socialized, trained, and so that makes it open and close to a variety of things. It differs from culture to culture, but generally, if you take music in a sense, musicians are the best example because they are the most open of us all. Because they respond to sounds much better than we respond to words. And they know what's they can absorb and what they can't absorb. And know what the politics are in terms of tuning and communication. But nevertheless, these acuities are open to specific aesthetic constellations, which we'll come back to in a second. That and this, and an artist can be in a confluence, quite a few of them. I might be listening to hard avant-garde jazz at five o'clock in the morning. And then, as I was saying yesterday, go and be part of a church choir thereafter and work in choral work. And I might also then have a punk band in the evening in order to make some money. Okay, you know, so I will be listening to all, all kinds of things. So, the concept of constellation, as I said yesterday, borrowed from Adorno, which is just slightly off Hegel's idea of a totality. But it is something that hangs together to certain principles. For example, a constellation would be the world of surrealism. You know, there are certain things, people who've been influenced by surrealism, that are done in a certain way, and not in another way. So, okay, so if we can get that in order, what I'm trying to say is that in times of social ferment, you have an intensification of all these <coughs> capacities amongst creative people, and they respond in interesting ways to the new audiences and the new settings they're finding, and through that, something happens to the expression. At the same time, these contexts and these valuations that are happening create competing groups, competing ideas about what is correct, what is appropriate for you, the people, what is appropriate for the working class, what is appropriate for the struggle, what is appropriate, and these definitions of what is correct, not correct, and everybody is saying, no, no, we are better than others. And stuff happens as well. In other words, it's not just a hunky-dory, wonderful experience being out there doing um, these creative things. So, but out of all these transformations in the literal sense, what I also argued yesterday is that you have certain aesthetic cadences that have become archetypical archetypes for others. And this is how 
music, this is how performance, this is how literature moves. So, there is in this, there is constructions of visual, acoustic, literary archetypes, there is a new language of the optic that might develop repertoires of performance, idioms of expression that may move and can move. And there is no better example now, and I move to the sec second year, that we really covered quickly what we were covering yesterday by using big words. But let's take conveniently, because it was the most well-described city in the world, Paris, in the 19th century. We have two fantastic writers writing about it extensively. Benjamin, on the one hand, I'm sure you must have, as cultural <coughs> studies people, Walter Benjamin must have appeared somewhere, or is lurking somewhere in the background, or hiding in a footnote, or hiding in the library. <laughs> no. Benjamin, or Pierre Bourdieu, most recently, the late Pierre Bourdieu, writing about Paris. Now for Benjamin, Paris was a city of revolutions, 1848, 1872. It was a city that itself was becoming art. Architecture, the bohemian life around the streets, the famous project on the arcades. All of a sudden, Paris was becoming both a city and a metaphor for the creative uh, people of the day. And also, what in his little notes in the arcades, he starts describing Paris, not the official Paris, but the Paris of refugees, of blacks, of free slave, freed slaves from the French colonies, of Jews, political refugees from Germany, when Marx was there in 1844 writing the philosophical manuscripts, and all that kind of a, a subaltern multiculturalism was part and parcel of the Paris of those days. And he basically wrote these fantastic essays around the concert of the flaneur, the concert of the bohemian, and so on, of the new kind of personality that started emerging out of the cityness of Paris. And his main poet, as we all know, was Baudelaire. He spent a lot of time describing and addressing the poetry of Baudelaire, which was his attacks on religion, his sights of the street, the way he wrote about things, was really an irritant to bourgeois Paris uh, during that time also his way of life. So, at the same time, if you look at Baudelaire's poems and you look at his love poems, you get a bit irritated because he exoticizes someone other who indeed was his lover, who was black, and she was, um, a, what do you call it, a, a performer in the theatres of, of Paris. So, it's, you know, the Orientalism um, is a bit in Baudelaire as well, although he loved the Orient in his bedroom. So, <laughs> uh, now, for Bourdieu, it's, more, it's a different thing, trying to understand the same Paris, the same time, but he's trying to create the science of the aesthetic sphere. And there, he forces us back to the time when France, and by implication Europe, was in a struggle for the independence of art or the independence of expression and intellectual and aesthetic freedom. And the right for pure art to express itself. And the artist to express him or herself in any way. And so it was both a philosophical, a political, and an anti-repression struggle during, during that time. And he looks there to there the creation of the autonomous fields of arts, how they create their own laws about what art is, how they defend it, how the various associations and societies start cultivating the literature, start creating the possibility of art to be exhibited in more democratic ways. And we have a picture of competing groups of Paris on the move. Now, unfortunately, we don't have the equivalent of Edward Said in you know, to have done the same as Said did to London or to England. 
But it's obvious that what was in Paris is different what was canonized as French and what was canonized as literature during that time and most importantly for the rest of the world what was exported as French culture to the colonies. So the process of canonization we're experiencing now were happening then as well. This Baudelaire was never sent to the to the colonies as a French poet, you know, in the, in the primers, others did. So there was a process of colonization and presentation of France as the cosmopolis of culture and civilization, which became the imposing both metaphor and reality for colonized intellectuals in the periphery, who, if they had the money and the resources and were clever, would then do their pilgrimage to Paris and then face the contradiction between what they thought France was and what France is. So that's the story that's coming in a few minutes' time. Nevertheless, the, the, the Bourdieu sociologization of Paris is very useful in outlining how Paris could become a place for competing movements, the realists, the futurists, the surrealists, the art for art say people and so on. It was a hive of activity between the 1890s and the 1910s, 20s, Paris was it. Now, we could do in London, we could try Berlin, we could do other things, but Paris had certain qualities because they're convenient for me, what I'm going to say in the next few minutes. I'm choosing Paris because I want to talk now about a concept of incendence, not transcendence. Incendence. What happens to people now who come to Paris from the other world? Face what they thought Paris was and they discovering what it is in their daily lives. And they see not what was told them, but what is happening as modernism par excellence. This is what the modern is. <coughs> the implication of this dialect is that what, where they come from, is precisely the opposite. And there are peculiar responses that we need to be aware when we're looking at the story of literature, the story of performance, the story of art. I want to take a few stations just to illustrate the example. Let's take the Russians. One of my favorite poets is Mayakovsky. Now, you can't just put Baudelaire, Rimbaud, Mayakovsky without telling another story. What Mayakovs and the Russians were responding is to Paris as the cultural capital of the world. That's where the good art was. That's where good performances were. That's what existed, that had to exist in their own country, which was backward, which was in need of transformation, which was the Russia of the Tsars, which was an oppressive society made up of serfs, apart because they were released just, you know, they were free just before. It was an unmodern, undeveloped, underdeveloped, a peasant place with a few cities that had oriental intrigues about them and they had to be rejected. You see developing out of the Russian intelligentsia, artistic intelligentsia, or what Bourdieu calls a proletoid intelligentsia, and because they had no jobs, you know, they were educated, they were good artists, and so there were no, no jobs around. You know, you see that hypermodernism there, and a celebration of the scientific and the technological. It takes, that becomes primary. So, 
You can look at it in art, because Mayakovsky is also a fine artist, not as fine as some others, but he was there in, 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 the, in those schools. You see the emergence of constructivism, of suprematism, of um, people like Malevich, or people like Isinski, or in the theatre, people like Maya Hall, in the film like Eisenstein. We do all these as canonical figures. But the thing you have to understand is the response and the hyper, almost fetishization of the power of geometry, maths, science, and technology. The, the adulation of Taylor, the adulation of the machines, the high brigades of poets going to factories after the Soviet Revolution, you know, praising the power of the machines, you know, and describing the, the infinite <coughs> strength and possibilities. There was a sense that romanticism, a sense that anything that was traditional had to be fought against. So you had a very strong school and you had the emergence of prolet cult as one group and other groups, the realists, then of course the socialist realists coming out of this in response to what was happening. And Mayakovsky increasingly in his poetry starts becoming more and more and more isolated after the Russian Revolution. A revolution that Paul he called his own. You know, the people who interviewed me said, you know, what is your attitude towards the revolution? That what the revolution? This is my revolution. Of course, he was fantastically egocentric, very powerful in oral contexts. He, what I'm trying to say is that the idea that he could become the poet of the people, an emerging revolutionary people, who were breaking the shackles of traditionalism, imagining himself as the megaphone of the revolution, imagining themselves as the machine that produced words for the revolution, and with a loud voice being at once with what was going on, created some of the most intense poetry ever imagined. It is expressivism at its most extreme. You know, take his love songs for a job about this, or the clown in trousers, and where he declaims you know, he, his love, and where he grabs the phone, this symbol of new technology, and he just describes how his words just kind of hot go through the wire, and he sees his words exploding on the other side, you know, with love. Or his invocations at the end of Proeto, of the Soviet engineer, chemical engineer of the future, that has to really reconstruct him uh, in the future, which is going to be a better society than the Philistinism that he was seeing around. And it should resurrect his love as well. And then to that, to the science engineering, there will be in a communion of communism in the future. But what I'd like to say is that this idea of him, the megaphone, the absolute, the voice, the power, the people, the revolution, and so on, really formed his words, his stanzas, his styles. And if you go into Russia, they rhyme. Most of them rhyme. You should see how long those poems are. You know, in English, they don't rhyme. <laughs> they look jagged. So, so there is, in a sense, Mayakovsky in the context of this. But he is in a context together with others who are mouthing um, all kinds of things. Now there comes a moment when resources are not right and there is a battle within the competing fields of arts and the socialist realists win the day and that everybody else gets stopped chased out, silenced, and social realism becomes the scientific way of doing art. And you have, on the other hand, the most ambiguous text in history, because I will come to just now, Stalin's on the national question, 
which is then read by others, and other things happen when that is read by others. But nevertheless, you have this poetry that emerges with him feeling being part of a new aesthetic constellation, part of a new radical impulse, part of an imagination that it was international and local at the same time, it has left cadences around out of this particular feeling that he had to insert himself in the shit or from him and the reality of the revolution. And so that's one little example. We can expand the examples. We can say there is Plucky Young, Plucky Rivera, Diego Rivera from Mexico. Fantastic mover of the hand and maker of images. Good got good marks. Ends up in Spain trying to pilgrimage. You have to find Picasso. Okay? Picasso. By then, Picasso, where's Picasso? Picasso is in Paris. Part of the ferment that's happened in Paris. Why did Picasso have to go to Paris? It's because of what we said about uh, Paris and because of what's happening in Spain. So, anyway, so Rivera goes there, tries to join the Cubist circles, they reject him. You know, he draws fervently like the Cubists, they reject him. He goes down to Italy, looks at all these frescoes, <coughs> says, mm, 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 gets very disappointed, gets heartbroken. It goes back, there has been the Mexican Revolution happening, there's a new government there, spaces are opening, and out of that, and reading Stalin's on the national question, so that's realizing that there could be a national voice in inflecting vision, it doesn't have to be like what happens in Paris. And he and others, as we know from the art classes, start the muralist movement. And what you see in that muralist movement is this fantastic pueblo, the emergence of the people, the history, the indigenous histories of Latin America being displayed, the violence of colonization, their art, then all of a sudden it's all about public spaces. And people have had to work on you know big, 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 big scales in order to be part of the new the revolution. But then all of a sudden the indigenous nature the tropics, the coldness of the mountains of the Andes, the warmth of the Caribbean, the fruit, and so on. Everything starts appearing in those um, in, in those murals. And you can prefer Siqueiros, or you can prefer Orozco and others. But what I'm trying to say again, there you see a transformation beginning to happen in the arts in Mexico City. And there is Neruda now, also having read the national question. And he, from being a kind of a, on the extreme of the romantic poetry movement in Spanish, having been in Spain with Lorca and others, and getting very, very caught up with this the flamenco and the music and the, the blood baths and the, the torre doors and so on, is dead the blood in the streets of Spain, the Civil War, goes back, joins the Communist Party, goes in exile into Mexico City, sees the murals, and there he is starting to say no. Again, his descendants is back into the folklore, histories, the magical pueblo that he saw in the murals, and therefore he reconstructs the cosmogenesis of the Americas, to come to general. So therefore, the birth of the epic is not just a rewritten, a retranscription from the original Spanish epics. Oh, let me write an epic now, because epic is cool, and you're gonna get me, you're gonna score me bucks. It is all a visceral, tactile experience of having seen the violence, having been part of the insurrections, and then all of a sudden, thinking that he's the poet of the people, knowing that he has audiences, and beginning to write larger and larger away pieces, away from the old, smaller, romantic, or quasi-romantic poetry. 
And Neruda's poetry becomes paradigmatic now for Latin America. You know, so, and beyond. We can do the story by looking at Césaire. Clacky Césaire from Martinique off to Paris. Paris, what he thought would be, wouldn't be. Race becomes a major issue. He stops <coughs> feeling what it means to be a colonized person in the cities of Paris that were supposed to be of enlightenment. He also is studying the national question. And out of that experience, what comes out is the poetry of Negative Jude. And there was key, again, is surrealism. Surrealism allows him to destroy, in his words, the French language and make it serve the colonial voice or the black voice. And therefore, the imagery is saturated from these juxtapositions that surrealism is so great about. So, Césaire as well is, through his sentence, says, what? Am I humble enough, he says, for example, have I enough calluses on my knees, enough muscle in the back, to crawl in the mud, to struggle in the, in the grease, or, you know, and so on. And he basically accepts Africa, accepts the primitivism ascribed to it, accepts that this is what Europe thinks about us, and that Europe is not to liberate us, and the, the rejection of the West in their broader transatlantic African diaspora starts from those poems of negritude. And like Neruda, and like Mayakovsky, and like um, and, 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 and Neruda Mayakovsky, and he begins to construct the epic of this experience of slavery, the return to my native land. In other words, it's another inflection, but it's another transcendence, not transcendence. If we are like that, let's face it, let's do it then. You know, so if you think we are like that, it's okay. Our heads <coughs> straight into the wind, the slave ship is in rebellion. You know, so that's the kind of poetry that begins to come out. So it even happens to my cousins, the Greeks. Elitis's Axion Esti, his most important poem, was after his experience in Paris, and he's going back to Athens and saying, is this the degrees of classicism? This is a load of nonsense. And he begins to also do like Neruda, the whole cosmogenesis of what the Aegean is, the islands and the gods, and mixed with weird pre-Christian stuff, and you know, his poem is one long exploration of that. So in poetry, what might happen, in other words, is that if you take all the story I told you now, you can say Rimbaud, Mayakovsky, Neruda, and others. If the people who are in control of the canon deem it to be so. Okay. What you see is something more violent in conception happening. Neruda, Rambo, this link is cut. Rambo, this Malam, Pegui, and other French people. And then you see world literature takes Rainbow and Lam, not the others, and links them up to something else, and so on. With the story of what created the impulses totally out of the picture. Now, that's, these are just the words, but there are worlds of sound, there are worlds of gesture, there's the theatre, there are all the arts, stupid warriors of what was happening to them. And social movements rise, social movements can decline. They go up, they go down. At the up moments, 
you see these cadences and the image and the symbolism coming back, people borrowing it when you use this, and so on. I will not dare an Indian story today let you bring the examples. But they come up, they go down, and through that it is a kind of a forest of symbolism and archetypes where people try and express things of deep emotional distress during those times. Now, let me move to my village because I'm more, I know my village a bit better than other villages. <coughs> I've been to Paris twice. So all, is, all I know from Paris is the mythical Paris of books, footnotes, visuals, artist life stories, and so on. I know my village a bit better. I get out of my door and see what's around. So in the process, of the 70s and 80s during the insurrection. As I was trying to describe yesterday, you get artists positioning themselves around the events that are going on. Now, it is important to understand how other voices respond as well. Yesterday, there is a moat, got a barbed wire, it's got crocodiles in it, and so on. You have three types of people here and three types of people there. The three types of people here basically say, struggle. Three types of people here say, we're in it. Okay. Your one person is your esteem. Distant from everything and defining himself or herself in that distance, that the prowess of one's art, one of one's expression, is precisely located in that distance. It gets polluted in that distance, gets broken. And this ISD belongs to aesthetic constellations as well, who talked about that before. The second one is the reluctant progressive intellectual. <laughs> who understands quite well class, race, gender, issues like that, and feels unable. You know, there's too many books between these years. And too much life in the suburbs. To get involved. So it's a kind of a, a response critical to this person, but again, distant. And the third one is the I've been there person. <laughs> I was there. I was from there. Thank you. <laughs> I'm happy here now. But of course, this person is critical of that too because there is something authentic about class, race, gender, origins that allows the voicing that could be critical to make the other people's experience and positionings inauthentic. And so, you know, those debates go on. On the other side, I am there. I am there. You know, that's my. You can't do art unless you're part of the insurrection, the people, you know, the smells, the violence, reflection, the pain, the, you know, there at the funerals, there to bury your comrades, there, this, you know, and you're there. So, this person is critical. Now think of each person as groups and kind of micro movements, networks, and so on. The other person 
like this one, the reluctant there. A cat dog being there. There's nothing, there's no kind of winch to pull me out. I am there, I'm of the township. I'm there, but I'm looking at the ugliness of things. Things are not as rosy as you think. But you know, all those people across the fence, across the boundary, they're talking a lot of shit. You know, that's not what the world is like. My poetry is different, my performances are different. My sense of loss is different from them. And she would be critical of everybody uh, else. And then you have, of course, me and my friends during those days who committed class suicide. <laughs> and you know, are critical of everything. You know, that's, that's why you're there. And be criticized by, uh, by everyone and everything. Now, as I was saying yesterday, there are multiple debates that are happening here. You could have mathematically 30. It was just over one issue. Now, the point I'm making is that think of France in the 1870s. Think of Germany in the 1840s. Think of India in the 1930s. Think of the US in the 1930s. Think of any time where there is intensified social movement activity and you will see the aesthetic field polarizing debates, new forms of performance. This is it, this is that. Okay, am I making sense? This is a process of, you know, it is both a dynamic, creative process and quite destructive for many individuals. What Mayakovsky experienced, being alienated from everything, many, many have experienced. And there are orthodoxies, there are this, there are that, but basically it gives you a sense of what happens. Now, all the positions taken, even to the most erudite argument about art for art's sake, is response not to something only that is happening in Paris or London. It is a response to this schmuck here. It is a response to this person. It is a response to that person. There is a relationality of argument there that basically shapes expression, even if you're the most privatist person on earth. had the wonderfully disabled white poet, Lionel Abrahams, who wrote amazing, intensely privatist poetry in rejection to what was happening around him. That intensity of expression is not explicable without the criticism, the jibes, you know, you fool, you white idiot, you know, that's going around. So, right. So, the, what the canon does, and that's where my experience started wanting to find out more. What the canon does, then, to start with, because of that insurrection, take any anthology of poetry that was published in the 80s would be inclusive and will split the voices in interesting ways. Five years on. It'll take some. And here come the two further processes of violence. It will not take those three out of an internal argument of coherence or an internal power balance in the society anymore. But it will take it from elsewhere. From canonical centers. And those canonical centers respond to certain what are seen as universal concerns. If the poetry of human rights is in, certain people will be selected. If postmodernism is in, 
well, let's this person, perhaps, there's some fragmented verses here that might appear in the text of the mythology of contemporary poetry. If another trend is in of hyper-suprematism at the moment, or neo-impressionism, and everybody goes to conferences like that, the next anthology will be like that. You know? So, although Paris, London have disappeared from the immediate horizon, the still the selection process follows the conferences, the peer groups, the gatekeepers, and so on that are constituted at places elsewhere. And it is an absolute privilege, if you're a local, to be included in those decision-making processes. But the rules of engagement with that are over. So the history of art and its relationship to social movements, expression, is a history of the debris, mostly left behind after certain things have been selected or excluded. The second violence is not only about peer groups anymore, <coughs> it is about Fax, Imali, money, resources, the market, what people think is marketable or not. And plays and poetry, I'm afraid, don't make it. Yeah. If it wasn't for the schooling system, I don't know, we agree on it. Where, who publishes plays these days? Who publishes? Yeah. Very few. Publishes, publish the poetry. Whereas art fetches a fantastic price. Uh, and the new media rock, although if they can solve the, the copyright problem, then they'll do more. So, what I'm trying to say, combination of market and gatekeepers define what is remembered. It is fine to understand the process and see how the selection is happening, but there are three implications. Firstly, the more you understand the process, the more intensely you understand the art. At least you understand let's say the sociology the behind or whatever your favorite field is behind this appearance of a certain aesthetic intensity and energy the better you are and I'm saying you will find that in most of the canonical texts on what artists and so on do secondly if we believe the nonsense that we're talking about we have to bring the artist back into the reflexive, reflective process. Because to understand the acuities, you have to understand, let's call it the social ecology around this center we call the creative group, the creative person, the creative ensemble, and so on. And also, it's the internationals of the imagination and everything that comes into, into this. This as well would have been hasted out of the account that says there's Ato Kyuga and then there's the idiots that I see that work with and somebody else in South African theatre and so on. You know, just you won't understand what that work is about. So that's the second thing. The third thing, which is the most difficult one, is that the implications of what I'm saying, if I'm right and we've visited in the class yesterday, is I'm arguing for approximate 
universalism and not an a priori one. In other words, what is beautiful, profound, whatever the cliché word you want to use for us to distinguish something from something else that we want to study, enjoy, and so on, is not, doesn't fall from the sky, doesn't get, and I be offensive, doesn't fall out of the bed as It doesn't happen like that. It is an approximate process of learning and definition as opposed to the usage of a priori categories. All aesthetics of any substance are Platonist, in essence. They do believe there are criteria of judgment that are absolute, universal, and transhistorical. I'm arguing it's work in progress. They're arguing they exist. And that's a debate that's worth having. I had it with, as I said, with Alain Badio, who didn't agree. He is a very convincing man. <laughs> um, very convincing. But I do, cannot see my way around, and I need your help perhaps, out of proximate universalism. In other words, the creation of aesthetic constellations, newer aesthetic constellations, newer ones, newer ones, that approximate something that changes all the time. Because societies change. And that's where we get <coughs> so That's the third <coughs> challenge. So, my plea to scholars who are interested in things beyond their palette, beyond their pencil, beyond their body, beyond what's in their brains as words shaking around needing of expression, it makes a better cultural scholar to bring the social in, to understand how power operates and how gatekeepers use power to exclude and include, how canons are constructed, but never to reduce the importance of a piece of work and its efficacy to just those relations. There is something distinctive that was done by our friend Picasso. Rivera was not stupid to be running after him. And it was awful of Picasso to slap him. But you know, so something happens in art that has its own rules of engagement. But I don't think that we can ignore the social. And finally, these explosive processes of challenge, of contradiction, of class war, of civil war, of movements, and so whether the, even kind of social movements that don't know of each other, all these are very creative contexts that do things to our creative abilities, whether we climb in the fray or not. If you climb in the fray, notice that your voice gets louder, your paintings change, your language itself changes, even your grammar changes. If you stay outside, you're never closing your eyes, because your eye is in the world. And these things affect you. They intensify your inner space and make a more solipsist, egoistic, individualist, happy rich artist. Sometimes. So I'm panting for the importance of bringing the fields together. So I understand these social explosions do something remarkable.
Applause. Thank you. Running around because of genetic engineering, 
<laughs> he came in the same coil because it's cloning. <laughs>
but which you allow them. So he argues there is something like that. And it is that's where I had difficulty with French and with this English translation of the French. Where does that come from? I think that's where is that capacity? Is it the capacity of the philosopher king who licenses the philosopher, the philosopher king? Uh, who says that I am the philosopher king? I choose Césaire, you, and Genet as the representatives of French culture. Yes. Now, because me, the translocal, universal, intellectual philosopher king, know that. Like I know the number one and the wholeness of the number one. So I don't know. I don't know. I'm just perhaps it's bad translation. Perhaps he hasn't. It is nice. We do sense that there is something profound in pieces of it. But can we say that it's divorced from our historical make? And the scientists will say, where is that gene? Where is that philosopher king gene? So we can spread it around more democratically. I don't know. Now, both arguments can end up, though, you're right, in circularity. What breaks it is the historical construct, or a historical construct that one can say, at this time, history, when people have become so hardened, certain songs of sorrow of the old medieval time are cliches, and therefore they do not pertain to the poetry. Or certain poems of European modernity are so embarrassing about the other that should be torn out of books because they're politically correct. I don't know. But it's important to struggle through that. Next week, here, about 
of the world's populations are governed by legislation that allows you to express what you have to say and no formal sanction will happen. 51%. It's a big victory. 51%. And uh, without it getting formally beaten up. But that doesn't stop your neighbors from beating you up. Okay? That doesn't stop your society from marginalizing uh, or attacking you. And we have these phenomena still. So that's what happened to artists. Uh, on the one hand, it seems that it is the most innocuous thing about the other things in life, but it invokes a lot of violence at the same time. And hopefully there is a room for all in any transition. Downwards, pouring sweat at dusk, downwards, 
riveting all around, and it's gone dark. <laughs> <laughs> there is a stage, no stage of heaven that cries. There is, there is a sky, yes, blue light, grey light, alien light, weighing downwards, pouring sweat and dust, downwards, riveting all around, downwards, yes with only sideward escapades. They are here, mechanical bullfrogs and cicadas grind away. And sometimes, sometimes wounded cars off by, pierced by asagades spears. And sometimes, surfers emerge from the mouths of microwave ovens. And always, life goes on like the sound of splintering glass. It's held, hemmed in. Its forced geometry of concrete foils spreads outwards, sidewards, in its rashes of sackcloth, of shack, of specification matchbox to catch the stitch of hills as near the docks the boss drives by in his shapestone bends as his boys load, kicks the tribe's skull as cargo here, there, confined. The visions of heaven subsided long ago with the arrival of sails clicking under a hyper load of sparrows, here, there, in this maze of splintering glass. In this expanse that claims me, in these infernal flame waves, telling my fate, I was lost there, smiling porcelain smiles and waving oxide kites. So, trying to get to the humidity, the violence, the tension in the hills, the smells, the town, and so on, just describing it. And some of the references are very specific. Like Shepstone was the person who did the native policy and put Africans into reserves. So Mercedes then becomes something else. So anyway, the other one is a recent one that went viral. <laughs> and it was written on the night when recently I haven't done something like this in ages. Recently, our minds were shot by the police. You know, the Marikana uh, massacre. And I'm afraid it's one of those fall out. The night is quiet as the smelter has been closed. The music is of the wind on razor wire. The ears are there too shut to hear the ancestral thuds on gold skin. Humanity has died in my time. Who said what to whom remains a detailed trifle. The fury of the day has to congeal. The blood has to congeal. I reverse the footage, bring the miners back to life in vain. The footage surges back and the first bullet reappears, and the next, and the next, and the next, and I reverse the footage in vain, again and again in vain. The image of the man in the green shroud endures. Who wrote the blanket, and what was his name? There are no subtitles under the clap of bodies. Um, sorry, I'm using, under the, under the clap. Um, um, the are names stapled on the unformed skull. A mist of ignorance also endures a winter fog woven into the fabric of the kill. The loom endures too. The weaver is asleep. The land of the high winds will receive the man naked. The earth will eat the stitch back to a thread. What will remain is the image and I in vain, reversing him back to life to leave the hill to song. In vain, the footage surges back. Another pondo and who's a hill, another one the hill, the shooting quietens, another ant hill. My love, did I not gift you a necklace with a wondrous bird, pure royal platinum to mark my bond? Was it not the work of the most reckless angler of craft and ingenuity? Was it not pretty? Didn't the bird have an enticing beak of orange with green tint? Throw it away quickly, for tonight it will turn nasty 
and gouge the shaft and you will slam the neck. And it will hurt because our metals are the hardest. Gold, pig iron, manganese, yes, platinum. Humanity has died in Marikana. What's it? What is that Umzimu, that monster, staring back at us tonight? Darken the mirrors, switch off the moon, asphalt the legs. At dawn, the driveway to the master's mansion is a flaming flower, so radiant from the superphosphate flow of surplus oxygen and cash. Such flames, such a raw sun, such morning by the shafts that squat gives out the bracken and are waiting for the storm, the torrent, the lava of restitution, the avenger spirits that plant the helicopter blades in vain, in vain. Is also endured. The game and trout fishing of their elected chores, the auctions of diamond, art, and share, the prize stallions of their dreams, their supple fingers fingering oriental skins, and their silver crystals counting the scalps of politicians in their boat. The meerkat places, paces to the scent of blood. I wanted to pace to the scent of blood. She's the best, <coughs> the living totem of the mind's deep rock. The one who guards the clans for the night's devil. She's there as the restless ghost of ancestors by the rock face, feeding her sinew and pup, going her own. The women who have loved the dead alive, the homesteads that have earned their sweat and glands, impassive nature that has heard their songs, the miners of our daily world that still defies the harsh landscape of the furies, the near cut endures. Tall certainties of the past <coughs> endure. The weaver also endures there, green blankets of our shrouded dreams. Humanity has died in Marikana. The strike is over. The dead must return to work.